Thank you guys for coming to um, the Scarborough University webinar on cargo insurance this time around. So um, just real quick, uh, plug about Scarborough here. Scarborough um, has been doing these every month now, and we look forward to continuing them. Uh, actually, we're going to push this up to twice a month going into the new year. So we'll look for a, a couple free webinars every month coming out um, over the course of the next 12 months. Um, Scarborough is a group of five companies. We have Scarborough International, which is our international freight forwarder and customs broker, which uh, many of you know very well. Um, we have Scarborough Logistics, Scarborough Transportation, which are two domestic arms, um, one for non-asset based truck brokerage and warehouses, and then Scarborough Logistics for our actual truck assets that uh, mainly haul freight between Scarborough's offices. And then um, our newest addition is Scarborough de Mexico, which is Scarborough is wholly an operating entity um, with an office in Nuevo Laredo, Mexico. So with that, I am going to uh, turn our seminar over to our friends here with Roanoke. Roanoke uh, and Scarborough have been partners for a very long time, and Roanoke carries our insurance as well as our bonds. So those of you who buy bonds through Scarborough or buy insurance through Scarborough, um, Roanoke is, is the back office that helps us um, make sure that you get taken care of. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Jason and Ginny from Roanoke. Um, they'll spend about the next 20 minutes, 30, you know, 20 minutes or so walking through um, some of the basics of insurance. Then we'll open this up to questions and we will make sure we stop on time uh, to be respectful of everyone's time. So with that, Jason, Ginny, please take it away. Thanks, Adam. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to be with you guys this afternoon. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Jason Rogers. I'm Vice President of Client Development with Roanoke Insurance Group, domiciled in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, and with me is uh, Jenny Hilton. Uh, she's our Assistant Vice President uh, here in Charleston, South Carolina also. Um, Roanoke Insurance Group uh, is headquartered in Schaumburg, Illinois. Uh, our parent company is located in, in London, England. And we are transportation-related insurance and bond brokers. And I have to apologize in advance. During my travels last week, I managed to pick up a, a little bit of a bug, so my, my voice isn't quite uh, what, it, what it needs to be for today. So uh, Jenny is going to handle uh, most of the play-by-play the -play, uh, for today's presentation, and I'm just going to try and pepper in a little bit of color commentary. So with that, Jenny, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to, to get the presentation started. Thank you, Jason. And, and thank you, Adam, for allowing us to participate in Scarborough University's forum about cargo insurance risk and liability. Um, we're very happy to be here today, and thank you all for taking time to participate as well. Basically, the forum today has been designed to familiarize you with the basics of cargo insurance. Uh, we'll discuss the different levels of protection afforded by different types of cargo insurance, as well as where you can purchase insurance and how the product is actually priced. Let's talk a little bit about some risk management strategies. Um, the, the main risk management strategies you'll see here on the screen. Um, risk retention is simply just self-insuring. You feel financially capable enough that if cargo loss or damage were to occur, you could, you could just go ahead and pay for it out of your pocket. Um, a, a good example of risk retention is also deductibles. Some folks are comfortable with a higher deductible than others, which means that is just retaining that portion of your risk. Um, reduction. Basically, you can reduce your risk by doing a number of things, uh, changing terms of sale, inco terms. Um, you can also package your product appropriately for the risk of international transit. And of course, rerouting that cargo to make sure that you're not going through um, risk areas, such as um, areas that are susceptible to theft. Uh, the risk sharing is, is simply just the pooling of risk among the group. A great example of that is, is Lloyd's of London. Uh, they are a group of syndicates that simply just distribute the risk amongst themselves. And then of course the transfer. Transfer of risk is simply insurance at its best. Um, the risk is transferred to the insurance party in exchange for some premium. So we'll talk a little bit about the types of cargo insurance. Um, there's two main types that we see. Uh, the ICCC, which is the Institute Cargo Clauses C, 
C stands for covered risks. And we also term that as free of particular average or FPA. Uh, with this coverage, what it is is a named peril coverage. So in order for you to actually get coverage, one of these named perils has to have happened. So for example, uh, the burning, um, sinking, stranding, overturning, explosion, all of those listed below would be considered some of the named perils. But as you can see, majority of those perils will likely result in a total loss. So a lot of times people can refer to it as a total loss, FBA coverage or total loss, but it definitely has to be one of these named perils. It's certainly not a very broad coverage. Um, the, the broadest coverage that we have is the all risk, the ICCA. A obviously standing for all risk. And it is just the opposite. It's a named exclusion. So you will receive all risk of physical loss or damage to the cargo unless it's specifically excluded by one of these named exclusions. Um, these are some of the common ones you'll see. Improper packing, abandonment of cargo, rejection by customs, inherent vice. Those are all your, um, your standard exclusions that you would see in a cargo insurance policy. Why the need for cargo insurance? Well, cargo insurance is a valuable, valuable piece of a risk management strategy for all importers and exporters. It's intended to provide coverage specifically for physical loss or damage to cargo while it is in the course of due transit. So theft, uh, pilferage, rough handling, piracy, those perils would fall underneath that umbrella of physical loss or damage. Um, cargo insurance also is going to allow you to be in control of your insuring terms during transit. Uh, many INCO terms uh, dictate who's going to be responsible for the insurance. And if you allow the other party to insure your goods, you may not be getting the best possible coverage that you could have. Uh, there's always going to be the threat of general average, and we'll, we'll go into that a little bit more in detail later on. Um, we do have a slide for that. Um, it's statistically speaking that a cargo owner should expect to experience one general average every eight years. So if you're sitting there thinking, well, I've never experienced a general average, you should certainly consider yourself lucky. Um, and then, of course, there's always going to be carriers' limits of liability. I mean, they are always going to try to find a way to limit their liability some way, some shape, some form. This next graphic is an um, overview of the theft risk level. So notice we've looking at it from a global standpoint as, as well as from a domestic standpoint. And, and globally, the theft risk is going to be highest in these black sections. Um, these are your usual suspects, Mexico, Brazil, South Africa. Uh, domestically, the theft risk is always going to be greater when it's near a water port and or bordering to another country. So, for example, um, bordering here into Mexico from California and Houston, um, also right there around the Gulf and most certainly um, towards the uh, bottom portion of Florida as we get into the uh, South America area. This next slide is actually takes it a step further and it kind of breaks down that um, risk of threat by commodity and gives us a little bit of a uh, pie chart here. I mean, this is a staggering figure, $22.6 billion. Um, that is huge. And when you look at this pie chart, you can see the um, top commodities for theft are food, drinks, metals and electronics. I mean, obviously, I think everybody can agree that food, drinks, and electronics are definitely going to be your top tier um, commodities that would be susceptible to theft, but most people don't think about metals. Um, precious metals, gold, silver, even um, copper, all those types of things are very susceptible to theft these days. This is actually a live piracy map. And if you'll notice, the bottom of the screen here shows a couple of uh, links that you can link onto and it gives you live up-to-date activity from a piracy standpoint. And, you know, quite frankly, it's no surprise that the topic grips the public's imagination. I mean, in the 2009 Mersk, Alabama hijacking inspired the movie Captain Phillips with actor Tom Hanks. And so the issue of piracy against these merchant vessels poses a significant threat to world shipping. And now 
although your liner vessels such as container ships, row row vessels, they're generally considered to be at a lower risk for hijacking because of their higher operating speeds and most definitely because of their height above the water. But these vessels are consistently being targeted by pirates. And as you'll see here, some of the statistics noting 246 piracy attacks in 2015, um, 203 vessels boarded. The actual red dots on here are indicating the instances where the piracies were just attacks. The yellow ones are actually in an in instance where there were actually pirates boarded onto the vessel. And that doesn't necessarily mean the vessel was hijacked. However, they did gain access to the vessel, which is scary. And Jenny, I think it's worth noting uh, on this slide that uh, piracy is a covered peril under all risk uh, cargo insurance. Uh, however, uh, it's important to remember that all risk cargo insurance is predicated upon physical loss or damage. So just because a, a ship uh, may have been uh, hijacked uh, by pirates doesn't necessarily mean that there's automatically going to be a, an immediate claim or immediate uh, payment of a claim. Again, uh, there, there's got to be physical loss or damage. Most of the time, uh, we see that these pirates uh, are, are more interested in taking the ship hostage. They're, they're not particularly interested, usually, in uh, the goods that are being shipped on board. Uh, rarely are they actually stealing those goods, um, but, uh, but they're, they're taking the, the vessel hostage uh, for a ransom payment. So um, what we see more often is that uh, it results in a delay. Um, and potentially loss of market or loss of use of those goods uh, before they can be uh, recovered and, 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 and carried on to the final destination. And in that situation, normally there's not going to be um, an indemnity paid by the insurance company again because there was no physical loss or damage. So, you know, that'll be a negotiation. Uh, hopefully it won't happen uh, to anybody on the call, but if it does, um, you know, that will be something uh, that, that you would want to work uh, with your, uh, with certainly with your forwarder broker uh, and through the, the insurance broker and, and the insurance provider to try and come to, to some sort of, a, of a, an equitable resolution on. Yeah, Jason, you're absolutely correct. Um, they, they typically do not discriminate against what type of cargo is on board. They literally are looking to hijack it for ransom because those vessels are worth millions and millions of dollars. And the life of the crew on board is, is irreplaceable. So yeah, you're absolutely right. It's not about the cargo. So INCO terms are literally just terms of sale drafted by the International Chamber of Commerce, which define the responsibility of each party during an international shipment. And I'm sure that you all have seen these many, many times. Um, but you'll notice here what we've kind of done is kind of group these in two different sections. Typically, we, we state that it's best terms for buyers to use your F terms, your FCA, your FAS, your FOB. Um, in those instances, it is the best to buy on because you get to control the, your own shipping and your insurance. Um, you're not forced to work with the seller's service providers. Um, and the cost of insurance is not included in the base price of the goods, which will actually reduce the imported value. Um, on the other side of that, best for selling would be your C terms, your CFR, CIF, CPT, CIP. Um, basically, when the sellers are using these C terms, the buyer is responsible for the loss or damage. And you can guarantee the insurance sufficiency. You can determine that you're going to get the insurance that you think you're getting. Uh, and also, the cost can be included in the price of goods, which is always a good thing. We'll look a little bit further into the actual terms themselves. Um, CIF, cost, insurance, and freight. So, what this means is that the seller delivers when the goods pass the ship's rail at the port of shipment. This term is very, very common relating to insurance. Um, the seller goes ahead and pays all the costs and freights necessary. Um, however, the risk of loss is transferred from the seller to the buyer once it passes ship's rail at the port of loading. Um, and that's great, but the seller actually has to procure insurance for the buyer's risk. So if you're a buyer in this instance, you want to make sure that whatever that seller is getting insurance is what you want it to be because they are only 
mandated to buy the minimum cover. So for example, um, they could be insuring your cargo for those named peril coverage whenever you thought you were getting all risk coverage. So in that instance, the buyer would want to have a conversation with the seller and make it known what type of insurance they're looking for. FOB, FAS, so freight alongside ship and then free on board. The, these two are almost, they're very similar except for there's one crux here. When it's free alongside, the seller delivers when the goods are placed alongside the vessel. So for example, once those goods actually reach the port and they are on the terminal, that's where the risk is going to pass. Um, on the other side, it's free on board, which means it goes one step further and the seller delivers the goods on board the vessel and the risk of loss is going to transfer once the goods actually cross that ship's rail and board on vessel. And it's very important to note that exports that are sold on an FOB basis can still have a piece of risk while they are sitting um, alongside that terminal. So for example, if it's an FOB port of Savannah and that's where the named port is, while those goods are sitting on that vessel, it's possible that they could be at a risk because they have not actually, tra the transfer of risk has already developed. And Jenny, I would just add there, um, you know, a lot of times whenever we talk to exporters uh, who are selling under the, the F terms, FOB or FAS, uh, a lot of times they will say uh, they, they believe that they don't need to purchase uh, cargo insurance. They say, oh, well, you know, the, the risk of loss or damage, uh, it, it, it transfers, it's the, the buyer's responsibility to, to purchase insurance. And, and while that may be true, there are a couple of things that they don't always consider. One is, like you had mentioned, uh, the risk uh, during pre-carriage. And, and honestly, uh, we see uh, that um, there's a disproportionate amount of exposure uh, during the land side transit, whether it's pre-carriage or on carriage, but in this case, we're talking about exports. So um, that transit from their facility, their warehouse, their manufacturing facility uh, to the port, of course, the seller uh, is, is at risk for because the, the risk has not transferred yet. Um, and also, uh, there can be a sort of a credit risk. Um, and that, that occurs whenever uh, the seller has extended credit terms uh, mm -hmm. to their consignee overseas. So if they have their customer on 30 or 90 day terms and they're selling on FOB terms, then uh, of course the, the risk of loss or damage does transfer whenever it's, it's loaded on board. However, if the consignee doesn't choose to purchase insurance and there's some sort of a catastrophic loss and the, the vessel sinks to the bottom of the ocean, um, and say it's a million dollars worth of electronics, um, you know, it, it, it is certainly increases the likelihood that that consignee may default on their obligation to pay uh, that commercial invoice uh, based on those credit terms that, that were issued. So again, the, the shipper can maintain a credit risk under uh, the F terms if they have extended credit terms and, and not uh, controlled the insurance uh, transaction. Yep, you're absolutely correct. General average, we, we, we spoke a little bit about this earlier, but we'll go into a little bit more depth about it. As I stated, uh, a cargo owner should expect to experience at least one general average every eight years. So that's something that, again, if you haven't experienced it, definitely consider yourself lucky. Um, the, the term general average ha has kind of been around well before insurance. It's, it's definitely that shared risk concept that we talked about earlier. And the main goal of general average is to save as much of the voyage as possible. Um, when a general average is declared, it's usually declared by the um, captain and the vessel owner. And the catastrophic damage is usually um, accompanied with a general average. And once that is declared, all freight is seized. And what happens is every shipper on board the vessel has to post a general average bond, whether or not their cargo was damaged or not. So for example, um, if there was a fire that broke out on board a vessel and only the end portion of the vessel where the boiler room and everything is located was damaged, everyone else still has to pay a percentage of that damage because they're spreading that risk. 
Uh, typically, we see uh, a general average bond posted at about anywhere between 8 to 12 percent of the cargo value. Um, and if you do not have insurance in place, you'll have to post a cash bond in order um, to try to get your cargo back. So once you have insurance and a general average is declared, you simply submit your insurance paperwork and our claims department goes in and it goes ahead and starts to post that bond for you and handle all the paperwork. Um, and of course, you want to remember that the deposit is always subject to change. That's why there's a, a range and the percentage of cargo value. Um, it could take up to a couple of years to settle some general average claims, and they can be very, very expensive. We also spoke a little bit about carriers' limits of liability. I think it's really important to remember that shippers' interest cargo insurance is, is there to protect the actual goods. A carrier's insurance is strictly to protect them. And even though they may have coverage, they're always going to limit their liability. So for example, your ocean carriers, they're going to be um, looking at $500 per customary shipping unit. And that's been determined by COGSA, which is the Carriage of Goods by Sea Act. Um, it definitely limits the recovery to this CSU, customary shipping unit. And that was actually brought into play before containerization. So a lot of times um, the, the question becomes, what is a customary shipping unit? Is it an entire container or is it a pallet or is it a one box that's on one pallet. So I would encourage you to be very detailed when you are completing your bills of lading and you're stating what your cargo is and how it's packaged. It's one 40-foot container said to contain 8,500 boxes packed on 250 pallets, that type of thing. Because the more detailed you are, the more you have an argument to say, my idea of a customary shipping unit is a package or a, a pallet, not just one container. Um, international air carriers, that's a standard 907 cents per pound. Your domestic truckers, um, 50 cents per pound domestic air, same thing. Um, notice down at the bottom, the um, warehousemen were always going to have terms and conditions. And basically, they can um, limit their liability as they see fit. So when a warehouseman is limiting their liability and issuing some type of a warehouse receipt stating that they've received the goods. However, they're only going to be responsible for, um, you know, $50 a package. Um, that's their coverage. It's really not there to protect goods that are actually inside of a warehouse. In order to protect the actual goods, you would want to reach out um, to your international freight forwarder and your customs broker and have them secure that shipper's interest insurance for you because that is what will protect your goods, not the actual carrier's coverage. Um, and below there's some exclusions there. Uh, notice acts of God, fire, theft, um, all of those things, general average is the one at the very bottom. Those are all things that you can receive coverage for under a shipper's interest cargo policy. Right, Jenny. And, and, and so the, 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 really the takeaway from that slide is that every carrier, no matter what kind of carrier it is, every service provider has the ability to limit their liability. We talk to a lot of, of shippers and consignees uh, who are under the mistaken notion that if there's a loss or damage in transit, then the carrier who had possession of the goods is responsible for the loss or damage. Well, they may be responsible, but there are various um, uh, uh, international treaties and pieces of legislation that allow them to limit their liability. So they may be responsible, but uh, they're gonna be responsible to a, a very limited amount. And, and in the event of these exclusions, these are just the exclusions that are applicable under COGS of the Carriage of Goods by Sea Act, but there are similar exclusions for the other modes of, of carriage as well. Um, if the, the proximate cause of the loss uh, is attributable to one of these uh, excluded perils, then the carrier has no liability at all. So again, um, if you are concerned about loss or damage in transit, uh, please uh, do not rely on, on carrier's liability uh, to address uh, your, your exposure. Uh, you know, shipper's interest cargo insurance is not expensive. Uh, it is very comprehensive coverage, um, and, and it's certainly something uh, worth considering.
Yes, absolutely. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Um, so we're going to kind of shift into our uh, question and answer portion. We already have some questions coming in. Um, for those of you that are on, you'll notice there's a, a Q&A box where you can ask questions. You can mark them as anonymous or um, you can just send them through. Um, so I will start taking those in. We have a few that have already come in. I have a few here based on some of the stuff that we've already heard. Um, one of the things you guys brought up was talking about even if maybe my buyer is supposed to have insurance or maybe my shipper is supposed to have insurance, have you guys run into those situations where maybe they don't, where they've said, okay, we'll take it on and then cargo, then there's damage, and then all of a sudden maybe they didn't have enough cargo coverage or the coverage was inadequate or they didn't have any at all? And, and, and kind of walk us through what, what could happen there and if there's any recourse or how that works. Yes, that, that's a great question, actually. Um, and, and if the other party is supposed to be responsible for insurance and you've got some reservations about it, you're concerned about whether it's going to be sufficient or whether it's going to be placed at all, um, it is possible to, to do what we call a contingency insurance. And they would simply reach out to Scarborough and you would be able to insure it on a contingency basis, which means that in the event the other party's insurance was not placed or was not adequate, this insurance would come into play. It's clearly a following form and it only would come into play in the event that the other party did not do their due diligence as it relates to the insurance. Okay, perfect. Right. So, and Adam, I was just going to, I'm sorry, I was just going to add to that real quickly. Um, it's real important here to, to add that um, cargo insurance is, is not a homogenous product. Um, these, these cargo insurance policies are not all the same. Um, they, they will vary from, from insurer to insurer. Um, and it's really impossible. It's, it's not like a homeowner's insurance policy or a, an auto policy that you might have uh, in your personal business um, where the terms and conditions are going to be the same from, from carrier to carrier. Uh, the, the, the terms and conditions of, of shippers interest cargo insurance policies vary drastically. And there's really no way to know um, if you're relying on someone else to purchase the insurance. There's, there's really no way to know what it is that they've purchased. So, again, the, the, the first priority, what we always strongly recommend, is that you, if you're not controlling the insurance in a particular transaction now, that you uh, consider renegotiating uh, those terms of sale uh, with your client so that you can uh, actually manage the insurance in that transaction and know exactly what it is that you're buying and, and know for sure that it's going to answer a claim in the way that you expect it to be answered. And then sort of the fallback to that, again, is what Jenny had mentioned as far as buying that contingency insurance that, that in effect will, will top up uh, without knowing uh, what the other party has purchased. Um, what this contingency insurance does is it says, okay, um, this will be your, your minimum coverage. We will, we will give you coverage up to uh, this level so that if the other party purchases an inferior insurance product, you can be, and, and it doesn't answer a claim, you can be certain that uh, you, you'll have at least this, this amount of coverage. It's, it's the less efficient way to go, but if there's not an opportunity to renegotiate those terms of sale, it, it is an option. So, so kind of based on that, what is, you know, we may see this a lot is someone comes to us and they say, okay, I have $10,000 worth of goods and they say, okay, I want you to insure my product. And when we get all said and done, maybe the insurance value that we're insuring for might be $12,000 or $13,000. And then we always get the question of, well, why, you know, my goods are only worth 10. What's this extra two, three, however, you know, however much more it is. Um, so can you kind of walk us through those pieces of it, what's in insurance, um, kind of what that looks like as far as, as that goes and, and why we're insuring the values that we are? Certainly. Um, when you insure your goods, um, you want to do what we consider a total value insurance. So you have the ability to insure for the value of the goods, 
but also freight and any other expenses as well. And so what that does is it allows you to be reimbursed for other expenses that you would incur. Yes, if your freight gets damaged, you certainly want it to be replaced and you certainly want it to be made whole again, but you're also having to spend money on other items in order to get the transportation moving. So that's why we insure it for a little bit more than that. In, in an instance where there was damage to goods and they needed to be removed from the terminal. Say the container was leaking and it needed to be um, put into another container or maybe the terminal said, you gotta get it off of here. Well, you have to pay to have somebody move those goods to an offsite location. So if you're insuring for your cost of your goods, plus your freight, and then 10%, which would be in incidentals, you would be able to have your claim adjusted to include all of those figures, and you would be able to be reimbursed um, and make yourself whole again for what you've spent on this entire voyage. Oh, no. Because, because no matter what, um, you will, well, I never say never, but uh, <laughs> as a general rule, uh, you will not be able to recover more in a claim than the value that you declared and paid premium on. So if you only declare $10,000 because that's your commercial invoice value, that's fine. Um, and, and if there's a total loss uh, that's covered by the policy, you'll be indemnified $10,000. But all of these other incidentals, like uh, the freight costs, even if the, even if the container falls overboard, uh, technically you still owe the, the, the vessel operator, the container carrier, the freight uh, to move from point A to point B, even though he didn't get it to point B. So um, again, by, by ensuring, by including the, the cost of the freight and, and the 10% the, the markup that we always include for incidentals, what that does is it gives you a little bit of a buffer so that you can ensure that you are made whole whenever a loss occurs and, and a claim is paid and you have you know, these various sundry uh, type charges that, that you may not have been aware of until uh, the rubber meets the road and you actually have to deal with the claim. Got it. So with, so with incidentals, you know, what about a shipment that's time sensitive or, you know, maybe someone ordered some kind of shirt, a t-shirt for a specific event and it doesn't show up or things like that. Does it cover lost profit or something happens and something gets delayed and now all of a sudden I don't get a sale and so I want to go back and claim insurance value? Can you guys kind of talk us through what that looks like or if it even exists at all? Well, the cargo policy is intended to insure for physical loss or damage to the goods. So, for example, if you were shipping um, – a uh, container full of Christmas cards and they got there after Christmas, um, you would obviously have a loss of market there. Um, but the product itself is still intact. Um, so the, the shipper's interest piece is strictly there for the physical loss or damage, um, theft, hijacking, rough handling, things of that nature. Um, if it comes down to inherent vice, um, say perishable goods, um, that have not been shipped in a temperature control container, um, ice cream that melts, those types of things. Um, it has to actually be physical loss or damage. Um, delay and loss of market is something that the actual shipper's interest piece would not probably speak to. Got it. So, you know, a good note to our clients out there that this product doesn't cover loss of market share or loss of a sale or or that kind of loss. It strictly covers the physical loss or damage to your product. Not the, we didn't make a sale on time or something happened. And I think that's a, a common misconception. Well, I insured my goods, I lost the sale, so pay me the difference. Well, that's not how, that's not how cargo insurance is designed. Um, one of the questions we have here is, does my international cargo insurance cover the domestic inland piece all the way to the door, so either pre-carriage, post-carriage, and and are there instances that maybe it's a good, you know, maybe it's a good thing to have somebody look at the policy, especially if it's not coming through a third party, a freight forwarder, something like that, that is, you know, maybe in those CFR scenarios uh, where you go through and you know maybe someone only insured the ocean portion 
to Norfolk and it's moving all the way on the rail to Kansas City, are there scenarios like that and, and can cargo insurance cover all that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and, you know, and Jason spoke to this a little bit earlier, but all cargo policies are not created equal. Um, they are definitely manuscripted. And you want to have insurance with a very reputable international freight force such as Scarborough that has a policy that will give you door-to-door -door coverage, meaning you will have coverage from the time the goods are picked up from the manufacturer's door all the way through until it gets to the consignee's door overseas. Um, and it's imperative that cargo owners work with international freight forwarders because they know this business back and forth and they're the transportation specialist and they know their policy and exactly what they're getting. Um, and the value that is added to that is basically irreplaceable. Right. And, you know, the, uh, there, there are a lot of technical terms uh, associated with this concept. Uh, you may have, uh, have heard warehouse to warehouse uh, insuring terms before. Uh, you may have heard the term duration of risk. Um, th these are all different terms that are used to define where risk attaches and where risk uh, terminates. So it, it's very important uh, to, to read your policy and to understand your policy. And if you have any questions, uh, either to speak with your, your forwarder broker or with your insurance broker or whatever insurance professional that you're working with, um, to make sure that you understand that and that you don't have any gaps in coverage. But the good news is that uh, if you are insuring with Scarborough or if, if you are intending to insure with Scarborough, uh, we can certainly uh, confirm that that, that policy, uh, we have very broad duration of risks risk terms in there that basically say um, that, the, that the risk attaches as soon as transit commences at the point of origin and it doesn't terminate until it reaches the final destination. So in, in, in that case, uh, the short answer is yes, uh, pre-carriage and on-carriage would be covered. Um, however, if you're not insuring through Scarborough, please do um, have a look at your policy, talk to an insurance professional, and, and make sure that you do have that coverage because it can change, it can vary. Absolutely. Um, another question here, is there a minimum cost to marine cargo insurance? You know, again, it's, it's another great value that, that Scarborough offers. Um, as a shipper or a consignee, if you were to go out and purchase a cargo insurance policy uh, from an insurance broker uh, or, or from an insurance company directly. There aren't many insurance companies that will write policies directly for a uh, shipper constantly, but there are some. Um, usually, <clears throat> that will entail the, uh, the payment of a very large upfront, what we call minimum deposit premium. Um, and it, it, it's associated with what you're estimating your total annual premium is going to be. So again, if you're going to purchase your own insurance policy, there's usually a very large lump sum payable up front, not refundable. Um, it will be adjustable on the back end, and only if you ship more than and you insure more than you thought that you would. The really nice thing about purchasing your insurance transactionally through Scarborough is that you're not going to have that big lump sum. There may be, depending on, on, on different scenarios, there may be a, a per shipment minimum. Uh, but, but it's going to be very modest. It's not going to be a very significant amount of money in most cases. Um, but you're going to avoid having to pay those large multi-thousands of dollars up front um, in order to, to get a policy established. No, no, absolutely. Um, and, and I'm going to take one here. Someone um, asked, is, that, is there a calculator or something online they can plug their information into. Um, Scarborough actually provides some rate calculators out to a lot of our clients that, that have the insurance premiums uh, based into those calculators. So if you type in a cargo value of $10,000, it'll look at a few other things and then uh, kind of spit out what, what that number looks like as far as how much insurance is going to cost on that specific shipment. Um, kind of going right off that, um, you know, as in our policy, as in a lot of policies, not all commodities are created equal. So we might have um, alcohol or marble and granite or household goods. And so it's important 
when our client shipped to us that, that they tell us what they're shipping. Um, can you guys kind of walk through some, some of that and, and some of those maybe products that are not what I would consider normal or products that get insured at that normal rate? Jenny, uh, would you like to handle that one? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, are you asking about the the calculators? No, no, no. Okay. Just in general, like so. So in Scarborough's policy, there are things like marble and granite that are insured at a different rate than. What are some of those other commodities out there so people will kind of know as they're going? Because obviously, if they ask us, I'm going to be able to tell them. But if sure. they're out there either shopping the market or they're looking at something and they get a quote back, and maybe they get a quote from me and a quote from someone else, and the numbers look vastly different, there might right. be a reason for that. It's because, oh, I know you have marble and granite, and that's insured differently. Or what are those other commodities out there that, that the rates can kind of fluctuate on? Well, there, there's there's a handful, and and the usual suspects are going to be automobiles and motorcycles, uh, like you mentioned, the granite and marble slabs. Um, a lot of times, used goods will require a, a different rate. Um, also, alcohol and um, spirits typically will require either a higher rate and or some different insuring conditions. Um, also, anything that's breakable, such as glass. Um, that type of thing, and, and most definitely your perishables um, and, and things of that nature. They will come back with a much higher rate. Um, also, boats, we see that as well. Okay. And, and I think that the, the one of the keys is, is kind of two categories. Uh, one is what we call target commodities, uh, things that are targeted uh, by thieves, uh, things that are highly fungible, uh, highly desirable, uh, consumer electronics, uh, like you mentioned, the alcohol, the tobacco, uh, those types of things, and then also the things that are particularly susceptible uh, to, to loss in transit. Uh, like Jenny mentioned, the perishables, the breakables, those types of things. But you know, as a general rule, if if, if you know if, if you're shipping, uh, you know, what we consider to be general merchandise, um, you know, it's 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 going to be relatively reasonable. And nine times out of ten, what most folks are shipping would be considered general merchandise. Okay, good to know. Um, so you purchase cargo insurance and something happens. How quickly do most people recuperate their funds after the claim is made? Is it 30 days, 60 days? Is it two days? What, what do you guys kind of see as the average? Obviously, every situation is a little different, but on average, can we give someone just a rough number that says from the time you report a claim, going through any adjustment, any, um, sorry, any, um, you know, insurance assessment on site of the product, and uh, what is kind of the average claim length? Well, sure. Um, whenever you actually file a claim, um, what a claim adjuster is going to immediately do is, is establish a timeline um, because they want to determine where in transit this damage occurred and and to actually confirm that the damage did in fact occur during transit um, because that is what the policy is intended to do it is to cover physical loss or damage to the goods during transit um, so once a claim is actually filed and that timeline is established they'll ask for all the documents in order to establish that timeline um, bills of lading commercial invoices um, delivery receipts things like that and so the the biggest challenge with the claim is to get all of those documents and to establish that timeline and once that timeline is established and those documents have been submitted um, you, we can usually have a claim adjusted within 30 days okay so but again that's so, it the challenge. Like a, so it sounds like a, a lot of it relies on um, you know the import of the shipper um, maybe the forwarder kind of helping compile that, that set of documents and helping you guys establish a timeline and Certainly. once you do that piece done, then it kind of rolls into we all kind of take a step back and, and let you guys do your job. Exactly. And, and again, um, uh, another significant advantage of, of, of purchasing your insurance uh, through your transportation intermediary like Scarborough is that if, if, they, if Scarborough has arranged this transportation, they already have 90% of the documents that are going to be required uh, to, to file the claim. So 
Um, you know, it, it's not a situation where, you know, you as the insured are going to have to necessarily go around to a bunch of different parties and collect a bunch of different paperwork. Um, you know, again, working uh, through the intermediary, purchasing the insurance through that intermediary, they've got everything right there at hand uh, so that if there is a claim, they can help you uh, to get that information submitted uh, to the adjuster as quickly as possible. Like Jenny said, that is the number one uh, reason for delay in, in selling a claim. And then the number two reason uh, has to do with uh, with the survey. Uh, it does usually take a little bit of time, uh, not always, but, but in any significant claim, there's going to be a surveyor assigned, and that's going to be a third-party surveyor. Uh, it's, it's not anybody related to, to Roanoke or, or Munich Re Syndicate Limited or Scarborough. Um, this is a third-party independent surveyor that's going to go out and, and give his professional opinion as to what caused the loss, um, how it occurred, uh, all that good stuff. And um, it, it does take some time uh, to get a surveyor on site. Um, and then once uh, he goes and, and completes his survey um, and he determines what the cause of loss was, uh, he has to write up a survey report and submit that uh, back to the adjuster. So that's really the, the, the second most timely part of the process is, is getting that survey and, and the survey report completed. Okay. Yeah, and further to that, you, you know, trying to get those documents can be very difficult. Um, so working with your transportation specialists and having Scarborough having a relationship with other international um, transportation related folks such as terminals and carriers a lot of times those folks are, are a little bit more willing to relinquish documents to you guys than just someone off the street and because you have that relationship with them it's 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 very helpful okay perfect thank you um, we have another question that came in here, and it says we've been speaking a lot about you know larger volume um, ocean freight type commodity shipments. How, if at all, do some of these concerns that we talk about apply to air freight, um, uh, specifically uh, maybe expensive artwork or scientific equipment, things that are maybe very very valuable uh, and fragile? Um, can you kind of talk us through you know like? Like the question said, there's there's a lot of talk that we've done today so far on ocean freight. But if we kind of shift gears for a minute and talk a little bit about air freight, does it work the same? Kind of walk us through that. Sure. Um, you know, again, as we stated, not all policies are created equally. Um, and and if you do not have someone who has a very comprehensive, broad policy such as Scarborough, you may think you're going to get the exact same coverage on an air shipment that you would get on an ocean shipment. And that might not be the case. Uh, there may be different limits, there may be different exclusions. Um, on the Scarborough policy, I can certainly tell you that air shipments are handled um, the way that the cargo shipments are handled. So the policy is very broad. It is set up to allow ocean shipments as well as air shipments and domestic shipments as well. Um, so again, you want to be very, very sure that you're able to know exactly what type of coverage you're getting. And by ensuring it through you guys, they're going to know exactly what they're getting. And you're going to be able to assure them that they're going to get exactly the coverage they need. And it does go across the board. And I would just add to that that, um, you know, I, I believe that, that insuring air freight shipments is as important, if not more important, than shipping high volume ocean shipments because, you know, whenever we're talking about a high volume ocean exporter or importer, usually we're talking about containerized freight. And containerized freight is generally handled when it's put into the container and then it's handled when it's taken out of the container. Whenever you're, whenever you're dealing with, with small pieces, uh, air freight, you mentioned valuable artwork, <clears throat> these things are going to be handled multiple times. They're going to go through uh, different hubs. They're going to go through different uh, CFS uh, container freight stations, uh, different uh, consolidation, deconsolidation points, uh, and they're going to be handled roughly. There's, there's, there's not always a, um, a unitization um, involved in air freight the, the same way that there is with containerized freight. So I, I think that on the good side, um, usually an air shipment, um, the, the duration of the exposure is shorter, obviously, instead of, you know, a 30-day transit, you might be looking at, you know, a three-hour transit. 
Um, however, I think that the intensity of the, of the handling uh, can be much different in, a, in an air freight shipment and, and really, really speaks to, to the importance of in, ensuring goods uh, that, are, that are shipped by air freight. Well, and I think you bring up a, a really good point because a lot of, if I look at our, our client base who, who purchases in, insurance through Scarborough, it's 95% of those are ocean freight shippers, not air freight shippers. And, and I think you bring up a really good point when you talk about the amount of handling that happens. Um, I, I think you could also liken that to um, your standard LCL programs that kind of bring cargo in through the west or the east coast. That cargo gets deconsolidated, reconsolidated, moved further inland to get deconsolidated and then delivered finally. And so you're looking at all those people touching that cargo and, and, and that just raises risk for damage. And so I think that air freight and, and, and those shippers should really take a hard look at this to see maybe there are some better options out there for them as far as insurance goes. Um, how do you guys set your rates and costs? Uh, obviously, you guys sell to us and then we turn around and sell to our clients, but just in, in general, what are kind of the things that you guys look for as far as how, you know, how do we get the policy that we get compared to someone who maybe only insures you know, 10 shipments a year, where Scarborough insures, you know, thousands of shipments a year. How do you guys kind of look at that? There are a number of things uh, that, that, that are, are considered uh, in, the, in the overall calculation. Like you said, uh, volume is, is certainly uh, one, uh, one piece of that. Um, you know, we have a very uh, lean and mean uh, sales force here at Roanoke, uh, so it's, it's not possible for us to, to reach out and touch uh, you know, every single importer or exporter, and that's why we've chosen uh, to, to employ a, a, a strategy to where <clears throat> we, we partner uh, with, with high-quality companies like Scarborough who really consolidate those risks. So, um, you know, it, it's very attractive to us uh, to work with folks uh, who have a, a wide range of uh, customers and, and, and bring a lot of, of – um, they're able to consolidate a lot of, of different exposures together – that's also a benefit because one of the most important things um, to the pricing is the, the loss history. <clears throat> so, um, you know, generally speaking, loss ratios are, are relatively consistent, um, <clears throat> absent, um, you know, exceptional circumstances. So, um, usually the, the more exposures you can bring together and the more premium uh, that's paid in a, in a particular program, the better the loss ratio is going to be because usually the premium um, out, outpaces uh, the claims. Um, so, you know, I, I think that uh, loss history is, is, is a very, very important uh, aspect of, of the pricing. Jen, what else can you think of? Um, typically, we do look at, you know, target commodities as well. I, I think that has a lot to do with it. Um, but, but yeah, no, Jason, I think you, you, you pretty much covered it. And I think also countries maybe play a role in this. I know you guys and I just had a big conversation about a client that would have that ship's cargo from Pakistan. And, and, and some origins or some destinations may also play a role in, in what some of those rates look like. Sure. It could be be rates or, or just you know deductibles and insuring terms. So switching gears, still staying on on insurance here, but this is a question we get a lot, and it's switching to like the warehousing side of our business. So how does that work? Who pays for that insurance? Now, obviously, you know there's a couple scenarios, maybe cargo that we deconsolidate as a CFS station and then ship out. It maybe sits on my dock for a day or two. And then that cargo that moves into um, our facility for long-term storage, um, where does that insurance product shift it? And, and is Scarborough the one that's responsible to insure that cargo once it's sitting on our dock as far as if something were to get damaged? Or is that the individual company's responsibility to make sure they have insurance that covers their product, even though it's sitting at someone else's warehouse? 
Sure. Um, you know, and that's where we want to have folks looking to you guys to use your broad policy for that door-to-door -door insurance. Um, it does cover when goods are um, in transit and in a warehouse for a couple of days before it goes to the port or before it gets delivered to the final destination. Um, but, but to answer your question specifically, um, the, the shipper's interest insurance is what is the best product that would protect the goods while they're in the warehouse. Um, so if you are um, providing that to your clients and they're receiving that door-to-door -door coverage, then they would have coverage there. Now, if they needed coverage that was going to be sitting in a warehouse for actual storage, um, sure. and it's not consolidation, deconsolidation, that's something they can also look to you guys to provide for them as well. But it is a separate policy, and I think that's the point that I wanted to make sure that, that, that your normal cargo insurance doesn't cover your product if now I take control of it as maybe a fulfillment center, and I yes. take in a pallet or I take in a container's worth of goods that might sit here for 60 or 90 days and we might ship out a box or three boxes at a time. That's correct. Um, however, with that being said, you know, if Scarborough is going to be handling um, a high volume of that cargo and it's going to be in that warehouse for an extended period of time, um, you know, that's certainly something that you guys and Roanoke could work together on to, to maybe give them a one-stop shop coverage. But, but the short answer to your question is yes, that warehouse storage would be considered something, something different than the door-to-door -door transit. Okay, perfect. Yeah, um, and Adam, just to put a little finer, uh, finer point on it really quickly, um, you had asked a specific question as to who had the responsibility to insure the cargo. I would just add that the service provider, <clears throat> whether it's a warehouseman or a trucker or an ocean carrier or an air carrier, the service provider never has a responsibility to insure the cargo um, unless there's been an agreement to do so. If the cargo owner has asked the service provider to do so and the service provider has agreed to do so, then okay, the service provider has the responsibility to do it at an additional cost usually. Um, however, absent that agreement, uh, the service provider never has a responsibility to insure the cargo. The service provider may choose to insure their legal liability for physical loss or damage to that cargo. As we were talking about the carriage of goods by SEAC, mm -hmm. so where it's $500 per customer shipping unit or something like that, but that's always going to be a defense-oriented coverage, and it's always going to seek to defend the service provider uh, from any sort of liability, first and foremost. So again, um, please, if you're, uh, if you're uh, an importer, an exporter, a shipper, please um, don't rely on your service provider's legal liability insurance uh, to make you whole in the event of a loss. Um, if, it's, if, if loss or damage in transit is something that you're concerned about, you need to consider shipper's interest cargo insurance. Perfect. Well, we are down to about probably our last 30 seconds here. Um, I want to say thank you very much to Jason and Jenny for sitting on this and kind of giving your expertise to, um, to our client base and maybe some potential clients out there as well. Um, so like I said, I, I want to be, we've made a habit of starting and stopping these things on time and I want to make sure that we continue that. So um, thank you guys very much.